Good evening. Thanks for joining me live in the not British Library, but we're there in spirit. I'm Bea Rolat of the Cultural Events team, and tonight's event is part of our season accompanying the, the Library's exhibition, Unfinished Business, The Fight for Women's Rights, which we hope is reopening very soon. Uh, please buy books for tonight's events from the links just beneath the, the video that you're seeing. Uh, you can add questions here as well. There'll be a QA and a later and also your feedback because we love to hear from you. Um, can I just mention a couple of upcoming events this week? We've got tomorrow night communicating with outer space with the legendary Andrew Yen in conversation with Brian Cox. And on Wednesday night, James Baldwin's America and its urgent lessons for today. And that's with Eddie S. Glaude Jr. Um, but tonight, a conversation I've been waiting for for ages, um, springing out of the Bengali work of utopian feminist science fiction, Sultana's Dream. And it's with a dream panel, sorry, but they really are. Uh, my chair is the multiple award-winning novelist and anthropologist, Tamima Anam, whose scorchingly anticipated next novel, The Startup Wife, is out in June. Pre-order it right now, thank me later. Uh, so Tamima, I'm gonna let you introduce the rest of the speakers. Over to you now, Tamima. Thank you so much, Bea, and thank you to everyone at the British Library for supporting this event. I'm so thrilled to welcome you all this evening for a session that is so close to my heart. It's a tribute to the great feminist icon, writer, and visionary Rokea Sakawa Hussein, or Begum Rokea as she is known. Begum Rokea lived and wrote at the turn of the 20th century. She was from Bengal, which during her lifetime was part of colonial India and is now in Bangladesh. She was known for many things, but her two most important interventions were Sultana's Dream, the novella she wrote while learning English as a surprise for her husband. It was published in 1905. And the Sakawat School, which she founded in 1909 after her husband's death, and which was the first formal institution for Muslim girls education in Bengal. Begum Rokea spent her entire life in a kind of lockdown. Um, the women of her generation were confined to the Zanana, the women's quarters of their homes. And it was against this confinement that she raged her entire life. But she rages with wit, warmth, and compassion. And nowhere is this more evident than in her masterwork, Sultana's Dream. I'm joined this evening by three incredible writers, all of whom share a connection with Begum Rokea's legacy. So I'll just introduce them now. Monica Ali is the author of a collection of short stories, Alentejo Blue, and three novels, The Universally Beloved and Booker Shortlisted Brick Lane, My Personal Favorite in the Kitchen, and her third untold story. And much to the delight of her fans around the world, she has a new novel out called Love Marriage in 2022, so watch out for that. She's, of course, a Granta Best Young British Novelist, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Literature and the Orwell Prize and her writing has been published in every publication you can think of. Um, Lisa Ghazi is an award-winning win filmmaker, stage actress, activist, writer, and she's the joint artistic director of Gomala Collective. She directed the award-winning documentary film, Rising Silence, about the sexual violence survivors of the 1971 Bangladesh War of Independence. The English translation of her Bengali novel, Rorob, translated by Shabnam Nadia is entitled Hellfire and is out now published by Westland Books. Her current project is her feature film, A House Named Shahana. And finally, Nasima B is a performance poet, producer and creative practitioner. She's a trustee for Manchester's Young Identity, an advocate for contact theater and is the project coordinator at Manchester Bangladeshi women's organization, Onunna. She's currently working on an audio commission with New Creatives North entitled SALT. And her most recent residency was Belgium's Museum Nacht where she spent 24 hours with 14 artists making performance work. But first, before we begin, a taste of the story where all this began. Nasima is going to read the opening lines of Sultana's Dream with music by Alia Hussein from the archives of the British Library, along with this image of the Indian Ladies Magazine where Sultana's Dream was very first published in 1905. One evening, I was lounging in an easy chair in my bedroom and thinking lazily of the condition of Indian womanhood. I'm not sure whether I dozed off or not, but as far as I remember, I was wide awake. 
I saw the moonlit sky sparkling with thousands of diamond-like stars very distinctly. All on a sudden, a lady stood before me. How she came in, I do not know. I took her for my friend, Sister Sara. Good morning, said Sister Sara. I smiled inwardly as I knew it was not morning, but starry night. However, I replied to her saying, how do you do? I'm all right, thank you. Will you please come out and have a look at our garden? I readily accepted her offer and went out with her. I found to my surprise that it was a fine morning. The town was fully awake and the streets alive with bustling crowds. I was feeling very shy, thinking I was walking in the street in broad daylight, but there was not a single man visible. Some of the passers-by made jokes at me. Though I could not understand their language, I felt sure they were joking. I asked my friend, what do they say? The women say that you look very mannish. Mannish? said I. What do they mean by that? They mean that you are shy and timid like men. Shy and timid? Like men? It was really a joke. I became very nervous when I found that my companion was not Sister Sarah, but a stranger. Oh, what a fool had I been to mistake this lady for my friend. She felt my fingers tremble in her hand as we were walking hand in hand. What is the matter, dear? She said affectionately. I feel somewhat awkward, I said. I am not accustomed to walking about unveiled. You need not to be afraid of coming across a man here, she replied. This is Ladyland. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nasima. That was an amazing reading and you were hearing music from Alia Hussein. Um, so I want to turn to you first, Lisa, because um, out of all of us, um, you know, Monica, Nasima, myself, um, you're the only one who uh, went to school in Bangladesh. And I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about how, uh, what uh, Begum Rukia's legacy is in Bangladesh, um, where you learned about her and what is your relationship to her in terms of as a writer? Uh, while we were growing up in Bangladesh, we did not know Mary Wilson Craft, but we had our very own Rukia Sakot Hussain. Uh, she, her radical feminist vision shaped our very idea of feminism. And uh, we, we, uh, we, we, while we were, in the, while I was in school, uh, when uh, I read about her and uh, read about her journey, her life, um, it, it, although it uh, it happened, uh, she was born uh, some more than hundred years uh, before. Uh, but her struggles felt very real. Her her journey, her uh, obstacles, her sufferings, her frustrations uh, felt very real, um, and uh, and we could relate to her journey. Um, and that and that uh, you know that kind of uh, inspired us hugely. That how she transformed her life and how she transformed um, her entire, uh, you know, uh, womanhood uh, and, and, and make it possible for herself and, and for other women um, in her age and beyond. Um, uh, she, uh, she was a huge thing. She, she was all about breaking barriers. Uh, she was. Uh, she encouraged women to dream. Uh, she encouraged uh, us to imagine uh, and, like a bull, walk towards uh, towards it to make it a reality. Um, so she she is um, she is a beacon uh, to us. Uh, um, and and when I was uh, you know reading um, Sultana's dream, 
uh, there's so many things that that was absolutely awe-inspiring, if you know what I mean about his uh, this sci-fi kind of you know that that twist uh, science and 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 uh, it's so so uh, well ahead of our time. But one particular thing um, was really uh, very. Um, uh, you know, encouraging for us and inspiring for us uh, to make us believe that our mind, our brain is powerful. We didn't know that before. Um, we we, we, uh, we um, hear, we used to hear around us that, you know, don't cry like a girl or don't run like a girl. But she, she told us that, you know, the idea of uh, uh, incapacitating men, not by strength, uh, not by force, but by brain has been an eye opener for us uh, Bengali women, and uh, and and we could uh, we could see that we could see that even now that when men get threatened to see a girl with a book, um, a woman with a pen, so that is the most uh, important thing, and that that was still kind of uh, still may, make me so proud of her that to kind of instill that idea, that, that thought, um, that our brain is powerful. It, it is a radical thought even now. So that, that, that shaped our, uh, you know, our idea of feminism um, in Bangladesh, I think. And how, how do you think Rokea became such a national figure? Because what I find fascinating is that, you know, it took, uh, you know, it took the campaign to get the statue of Mary Wollstonecraft in Newington Green. It took them decades of work. But we not only have statues of Begum Rokea everywhere, we have Rokea Sharani, we have streets named after, we have buildings, we have a national Rokea Day on December 9th, which is the anniversary of her death. How do you think she became um, such a mainstream national figure? Because we relate, we can relate to her even now. You know, the struggle she had then, the same struggle we go through now. Uh, yes, women are, are, have, uh, you know, advanced in position, um, uh, in education, but it's very, um, very handful of women. Most of the women uh, in, in, in South Asia are, are still, uh, you know, denied their rights uh, to education, denied their rights to simple thing, you know, simple freedom that to go out for a walk is a huge deal. And, and this, so we, we know where she, she, she was coming from. We know uh, her anger. We can relate to her anger. We own her anger, and and the way she uh, uh, you know broke barriers uh, for herself and for us inspire us to do, to do even more um, uh, this day and age. So I think that because she's still relevant in so many ways in our lives in South Asia, that uh, that of course she will be like this for generations to come until we get there. And uh, I don't think she will be um, irrelevant um, ever. Thank you, Lisa. That's really great. Um, Monica, if I can turn to you, um, tell us about your literary inheritance. Um, when did you encounter Rokea? And do you, do you tell us a little bit about how you relate to that Bengali side of you and, and especially that literary inheritance? Yeah, well, my literary inher inheritance is really um, Western. I don't speak Bengali, don't read Bengali. So necessarily it has been, uh, you know, I grew up on the Western canon. Um, anything and everything I could get my hands on. I was a very voracious reader. Um, Jane Austen, Tolstoy, lots of classics. Uh, Narayan, um, Naipaul as well were sort of early favourites. But really in terms of Bengali literature, um, I didn't have access to it, apart from Tagore, of course, because, you know, we had that in translation. Um, so I think it's very different now for younger writers coming through because... Um, they can see that Bangladeshi origin um, writers are, are making their mark. So, 
you know, there's you, there's Lisa, there's Nadim Zaman, there's um, Shalas Asan, there's, there's so many, Dia Haider Rahman, and there's so many writers coming through now that, um, you know, I felt a bit sorry for my younger self. <laughs> I didn't have that um, that sort of model in front of me. And I think it's still so important. I got a letter, I got a, uh, a a school girl, she was 14, she wrote to me via my agent just last week, in fact, and she'd written a short story because uh, they'd had an extract in her GCSE English class, they had an extract of Brick Lane to look at, to inspired her to write a story. And she wanted to write to me to say um, that all her life she'd been reading extracts and books uh, with which she had never identified and she said it made me so proud and so happy nothing she said nothing in her life had made her so happy as to see her own culture recognized and that really yes yeah, so it really sort of warms my heart um that i mean you were so important to writers who came after you like me and so many others and i wonder um i mean which I'm sure feels like a great privilege to you, but also I think that um, that there also is a sort of burden related to that. And you wrote a little bit about that. And when you say, I feel sorry for my younger self, um, I wonder, um, so, you, so you wrote this essay called um, Simply Writer. Uh, and if, if I can just read a line from that, you said, um, if you're a writer of color, you're only supposed to write about what people imagine to be yourself. And that self is not an imaginative, creative, artistic, or intellectual self. That self might be labeled as Asian writer or Bangladeshi writer or BAME writer, but it is never labeled simply writer. That would be true privilege. Tell us about what inspired you to write that essay and, and, and where you are with that now. Uh, I think what inspired me to write the essay was actually um, an acquaintance saying to me, somebody I'd bumped into I hadn't seen for a while, uh, something along the lines of, have you heard that Random House has got this new scheme um, for BAME writers, Black and Asian minority ethnic writers, and you don't even have to be able to write well, they'll just publish you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> sort of, you know, in that mode of, isn't it ludicrous? You know, what kind of privilege um, BAME writers are getting? So that, that, that was the trigger for, for writing that. And it made me reflect back on my own writing journey and thinking, um, why is it that I haven't been able to write for so long? Why can't I not finish anything? And I think I'd just become sort of disheartened and depressed by... Uh, the idea that th there were certain things that were expected of me and that if I did not fit that mould, then it was seen as me trying to run away from something. So I actually, I did a, an interview recently. It was an, uh, an interview via email with a publication here. I've been perfectly friendly journalists, perfectly well-meaning. But one of the questions was, your new book is billed as a story of two, cult two cultures. Are you returning to something you sought in professional terms to escape? Now, uh, you know, I know why he's saying that. And I don't think he means anything terrible by it. But to me, what is that thing that I would be trying to escape? I mean, my ethnicity. Right, whichever way you look at it, whether you say it's expectations or brand or anything else, it's are you trying to escape your ethnicity? And to me, this is sort of an existential question because this, this idea of having to be one thing or another while being of dual heritage feels like a kind of obliteration of the self. I mean, I am both, I'm not one thing or another, I'm both. And therefore I do write about different things. So um, that's a rather long-winded answer to your question. No, I, I've been meaning to, I'm wanting to ask you this because I, I also feel like, do you wish you had been angrier before? 
when people kept asking you book after book, the three books that came out after Brick Lane, when they kept asking you, why are you writing about Portugal? Or why are you writing about, you know, a Michelin starred kitchen in London? Why are you writing about, you know, Whitechapel instead of Brick Lane? I mean, do you wish that, because I feel like now, if that had happened now, then there would have been a lot of outrage around that, you know, and people are just angrier in a good way. And, yeah. and do you wish you could have just been like, that's really racist? <laughs> uh, short answer is yes, I do. But looking back, I, I think in some ways I was naive um, or kind of colossally stupid to think that I could have the same privilege as a white male writer who is allowed to write about anything he wants um, and is credited with great imagination for doing so. It wasn't even a case of thinking, I just assumed and I just assumed with each book, okay, well, people will get over it, get used to it. And also there was this huge barrier to, to expressing anger, which is, it's just sour grapes, it's just a chip on your shoulder, you don't have the talent, that's, you know, so no one could ever accuse you of not having talent. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's sweet of you to say, but so those, those sorts of considerations, I think, stopped me saying any of that. Also, now that I've seen other writers standing up and saying those things, and I don't think we are, we can all be talentless. <laughs> so even if that could apply to me that I just didn't write well enough, um, I certainly do not believe it of other people um, in similar situations. So now I feel kind of empowered to speak my mind a little bit more freely. I'm ready. I'm ready for you to like tell some reporter off. Um, Nasima, I want to turn to you now. Um, you're a poet and a performer. Um, and tell us about, I mean, I'm guessing you probably didn't read um, Sultana's Dream in high school, by the way. She did write that in English, which is why I got to read it young, because I unfortunately um, don't read Bangla literature in Bangla, much to my parents' dismay. Um, um, so Nasima, tell us um, about your literary inheritance. Tell us, um, you know, where or if you encountered Rokea and, and where your kind of activism and your um, sort of inspiration comes from. Um, I hadn't come across Rokea and I hadn't come across this piece of work before up until um, B sort of emailed me and then called me up and we had a conversation about it. And um, I think for me, it was just a reminder that feminism comes from your home. Like as a Bengali woman, for me, feminism starts at home. Um, it starts with my mother. It, start, it started with my sisters and seeing, just, just growing up here and seeing that they're, they're struggles and, and celebrating celebrating themselves um, and being themselves regardless of what um, what Western notions of feminism imposed and stereotyped on us. I think, um, I guess reading that was just a reaffirmation of, of feminist icons always existed um, within Bangladesh and, and also within women of color. And yeah, it, it, it's, it's an epic, story it's an epic story and um if only it would if only it would happen i think on, on the video i smirked a, li a little bit when um the bit when um they said there's no men here it's just it, it, every single time i've read that bit I've, I've looked over the story a few times now um and every single time i come come across that line i just thought god what if women rule the world how different things could be and for me like i said I, i've seen that i've seen women ruling the world i come from a matriarchal household let me tell you i know some of my sisters are watching today um and yeah i th i thrive on i thrive on women telling me what to do and i love it <laughs> Well, listen, we would love to hear more of uh, from you. So would you would you read some of your work? Absolutely. Um, unfortunately, I can only do one poem. I was asked to choose and it's really hard to choose. Um, I had I had a couple of things, but I've chosen this one because I guess to me, this poem is sort of um, my own feminist exploration and celebration um, and, and what those things and what feminism means to me. It's called Antithesis. 
riot, headfirst, cataclysmic, button nose, lipped, thick, face, a disorientation from fingernail to kneecap, brain matter to boredom, a prodigy, seemingly a head, tie on hands, holding head, disapprovingly, left eye on small of back, a universe in thigh gap. She knows how to sit still when the world quakes in her palms and you are stood. Silhouette, silent, how do you name a woman that you see yourself in? A woman, part you, part human. Looks like Earth stopped spinning in midweek, planned a revolution in her sleep, an abortion for the keep through democracy to the wolves and told it to belong. Can you hear the heartbeat of birds? Can you see tongue leap from words? Is she saying enough? Model, citizen, coming for her dividends, shoulder, overlook. You can't see what is staring at you if you break back. Did you know she dreamed this? Pandering to Penelope makes you feel irrelevant, irrelevant in reverence. Why do you cock your head to the side and does your nervousness send tremors down your spine? Do you hear in time, is her wake too religious for you? Holy like harmony and holiday hum, hello kitty trigger happy, put your elbow back above forearm. Dislocating your body parts cannot amount the pain of birthing your human right. When mothers spill tea, they are rushing. Taste is perceptive, touch is eclectic. Harbour happens in head and belly, and I'll be there if you let me. Thank you. That was so beautiful, and I'm sorry we didn't have more time. In fact, I'm looking at the clock now, and we're already um, almost up to our questions. I wanted to ask you, Lisa, about your novel, Roro, which was published 10 years ago in Bangla and has just come out in English. Um, I found the novel so compelling. It was so dark. It, it had so much humor and yet there was just so much pathos in it. And I, I wonder whether you can talk to me, us a little bit about, um, did you set out to write a feminist novel? Did you set out to write a novel that would upend our ideas of what Bangladeshi women do and think about and how they act um, or not? Uh, when, uh, when I started writing uh, the novel, it, I mean, um, no, no kind of didn't have any agenda didn't have any uh, that I, I, I want to write a novel from a feminist angle it didn't happen like that at all um, this story uh, uh, I was carrying this story uh, with me for for some time and I, I was compelled to write about it um, though it is uh, hugely dark but um, uh, if we see, if we read, and if we kind of, um, you know, uncover the layers of it, we see that how deeply frustrated those women were, and how, and 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 the point they are at, um, uh, uh, what drove them to that point, and uh, how they kind of um, ended up being there, and that is that is uh, that has been like this for for ages, you know, that, that oppression, that patriarchal op oppression. And even in a household, there's no men, patriarchy still is at work. It doesn't have to be because it is so ingrained in our psyche, in our mindset uh, that uh, we, we become an agent. We women, we women, we become agents of patriarchy. And that is what, uh, that is what I have seen in my life. And, and that, is, uh, that is what um, you know, I was compelled to write. Uh, and it, it came uh, quite naturally. I mean, you make it sound um, kind of worthy, but it's actually really funny. And there's actually all these very 
strange and you know she goes it's about this woman who turns 40 and she's allowed to leave her house for the first time I mean talk about lockdown and she's imprisoned by her mother she's not imprisoned by a sort of bullying patriarchal male figure the man in the story is essentially completely powerless um so although you may have had all these kind of you know very strong feminist ideas behind the writing it is in fact an absolute joy and you're sitting on the edge of your seat wondering what is going to happen to this girl woman she's leaving her house for the first time and the whole novel takes place over the course of one day and it's absolutely nail-biting funny dark really really weird um and it made me realize that when you write an i i, I don't know i feel like you wrote the novel in bangla you didn't write it in English. And that meant necessarily that you were not trying to explain these women to people who had possibly never met them. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I wonder whether you can talk a little bit about what it's been like to read yourself in English. And then if you would read us a little bit from Hellfire for just a minute, that would be really great. Shall I read first? Um, it's up to you. Okay, let me read first then I... I will come to your, um, so I will uh, just, just a couple of lines in Bangla and then uh, in English uh, by the translated by Shabnam Nadia. Beauty ke patta nadia lovely party pe tipe mukhle shaibir khari ukhi dilo. Tini gophir khumi achunyo. Halka nadda kar shabda shuna jatche. Tarpur ura tinjun ranna khari ukhi diye deklo. Boa party pete, nishin de kumatse. Lovely booked pit at a hapore matotanamakutse. Lovely paid no attention to beauty. She tiptoed over to Mukles Shahab's room and peeked in. He was fast asleep. She could hear his light snow. The three of them peeked into the kitchen and saw Boa comfortably asleep on a mat. Lovely's heart was going a mile a minute. The three of them held hands and crept to the front door. Beauty held her breath as she pulled it open. It creaked on rusted hinges. In the silence of that afternoon, even that small noise froze them, like trees struck by lightning. Beauty was the first to recover. Are we just going to wait by the door? Come on. Silent. But with laughter bubbling through their bodies like boiling water, the three of them snuck up to the roof. As soon as they opened the door and walked out, their laughter exploded. A crow flew off the ledge. Lovely would never forget that moment when they stepped onto the roof, that excitement, the joy. She could no longer remember how long they had stayed up there. All she remembered was Amma's face like a nightmare, her standing there stock still. I mean, the, the end entire idea of this uh, this novel if you ask me what is the what is the one thing that that um, that I, I I kind of I try to you know shout to have to claim it's freedom it's all about freedom you know uh, because um, if you think about it if you think about it um, we women, uh, especially in South Asia uh, and, and, uh, and countries, even, even uh, actually everywhere, it, it, it varies, the degree varies, but uh, we are denied freedom in every aspect of our life. There's a boundary, a line that is drawn uh, for us not to cross. So freedom is a dream for us. And, uh, and when we uh, come to know the taste of uh, the, the very uh, freedom, we can know we can we can we can we can never go back to a place where we cannot have that and that is what is um, is with everyone with every character in that novel a lovely beauty even for Ida Khanum she did, she was denied uh, her life she was denied to uh, to have the freedom to live her life at, at uh, the way she wanted to. She was forced to accept her life. And then uh, by doing so, uh, she became, she became a, so kind of, uh, she became a, a, a monster to, 
to show everyone that what is she portraying? What is she, uh, you know, she, she's trying to show the Absolutely. world that her life is perfect. Um, and that is what she, is, she was imposing on her daughters. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you for that reading. It was beautiful. I love this book so much. I want everyone to read it. Um, Monica, when you write women characters, do you think of them? I mean, when you write them, do you think, okay, I, 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 there's something I want to say about the condition of being a woman, as opposed to when you write a male character and your, your, your main male character in Brickling was so beloved. Um, and you wrote him so affectionately, um, although he was also in his own ways violent and problematic and, and, and troubling. Um, so when you, do, you, do you think about your women characters differently? Do you, do you want to say things through them in a way that you don't with men or do you sort of, are you sort of even handed? Well, I'd like to think that I'm pretty even handed. Um, and I don't, I don't set out with an agenda as such that would be I think to me that would inhibit my writing so if I were to set out to um, a, a kind of uh, agenda or a sort of political program that I want to write to I don't think I'd be able to write anything creatively so uh, it's not that I don't have an interest in those issues. I do hugely, but I let it come from the character. So I always start with character and I always try. I, I mean, I, writing to me is a bit like method acting. <laughs> you have to sort of sink into the role. You have to walk a mile in that person's um, shoes as much as you're able to do so. And to find the kernel of humanity, even in those characters who you might not warm to naturally. So it's all about, you know, compassion and connection for me, the writing. Well, that definitely comes across. Um, would you read to us a little bit? Oh, what do you want me to read? Oh, um, well, I mean, if you, I, I, I thought we were all gonna read, but- <laughs> Okay. We don't, don't have to. We, 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 definitely, we definitely don't have to. Um, I, so, I, I think this question of the politics is so interesting um, because certainly, as I said, your male characters are, are written with a tremendous amount of affection. Um, and, and it's easy when you have feminist politics to sort of make your, you know, your women characters or, or, or your male characters kind of like, you know, sit on a soapbox and, and announce those. And you manage to not do that. And yet, um, that relationship between your characters in Brick Lane was a deeply feminist parable mm -hmm. um, and, and done in the most subtle way. And I wonder, um, I mean, did you, did you have that scene in your mind at the end of Brick Lane where she goes ice skating? Was that, because I, I remember it so vividly. Did you think like, I'm gonna tell a story of this woman and then at the end, I'm gonna sort of set her free. Or did that just come sort of naturally? Uh, you know, I, I really struggle to, to, to know what my end scene would be uh, right up until I wrote it. And I remember I was actually, I can remember really vividly for some reason that I was doing the washing up, <laughs> standing at the sink when I realized what the, the end um, scene should be. And it was, you know, as soon as I thought about it, I thought it was blindingly obvious. She, she'd had this fascination with, ice skating and, uh, and actually a bit a bit like Lisa that that image to me was about freedom or for her it was about freedom you know the sparkles the the free-flowing movement the um yeah total liberation from her ordinary life so uh, I got it sort of then and there and the, the scene kind of wrote itself after that but I didn't set out with that mm. didn't set out with that it's unforgettable I think a lot of a lot of people around the world have that scene sort of seared in their brains. Um, Nasima, tell us um, about uh, sort of we, when you perform your poetry and, and that, that poem that you read us was so vivid, full of imagery. And um, are, are you sort of speaking to a particular audience? Are you trying to tell them something 
when you combine some of your activism with your poetry, um, is there a particular message that you're trying to convey there? I think I'll have to agree with Monica on, on what she said um, sort of earlier. When I sit down to write, I just want to create. Mm. I mean, I, I just want to write a poem. Um, I just like words a lot. I've been a very, a very um, big reader since I was since I was very little, and I just like words. I like playing with them. I like how they sound. Um, a lot of a lot of what I a lot of what I do with with my work is um, try and say one thing, but sometimes mean the other. And I think that's what a lot of us a lot of us writers do. We try and sway from what we're sometimes actually saying. Um, and yeah, I think. For me, writing, the activism happens when I write, whether I want it to or not, but I don't set out to be an activist or to be a feminist or to write about racism or Islamophobia or any of the things that we're constantly asked about as as women of as female writers as as women of color um as muslim women or whatever whoever we are those things are just left i'm just a writer like 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 richard the white man who's who sold out do you know what i mean um yeah i think i think i just i want to have fun and i hope that whenever i write a poem or i'm performing that people just come on a journey with me and if anything makes you it makes you think and and it sticks out i hope that makes you do something about it um but i just i just have a little bit of fun and i hope that was that poem was fun but also it was quite serious let's be real it was quite serious <laughs> <laughs> it was it was all of those things um and it was beautiful thank you look i'm gonna turn to the questions because we have loads of questions and i think you know we can all agree that the fact that we can't do this live is a huge tragedy and it would have been so much better live but one of the things i really there's always that awkward moment when you do a live event where nobody asks a question for the first minute and the chair has to kind of sit there and look through their notes and trying to fill the silence. I don't have to do that because you guys in the audience have asked loads of questions. So I, first of all, Noor Jahan Begum has asked to all the speakers, where are you now? And how have you used the coronavirus lockdown in your creative practice and why? Um, who would like to answer that question first? Lucas, I'm going to let you answer because you, oh. I know where you are and it's the most exotic location of us all. So you can go first. Lisa. Oh. I, I think maybe Lisa can't hear us. So maybe Nasima or Monica, one of you want to answer that? Oh, I, okay, I'll, I'll take that then. Um, so I'm in London. I've been here the whole of lockdown. I actually used my time in uh, the lockdowns last year pretty productively because I finished a novel, which um, is the first in a decade. It will be out next year. Um, was there another part to the question? And was that it? I'm in London and I finished a novel. Well, that I mean, that's huge because most of us <laughs> just like baked banana bread and like try not to, you know, be too mean to our kids. Um, I'm going to go on to the next. Oh, Nasima, do you want to tell us where you've been? Are you in Manchester and have you been writing? Yes, um, I'm I'm based in Manchester. I have been writing a lot of my work is like this, which is really yesterday I hosted a show, which was really, really good, but it was no audience. It was when I make jokes that aren't very funny, no one's gonna laugh at them in a not very funny way and tell me that they're not funny. Um, so it's, it's really awkward sort of talking to a screen a lot of the time. Um, but I always like to go and have a look on look look at feedback on social media and I hope that um, there's lots of it. Great, so, okay, I'm gonna go to the next question. Uh, it's for Lisa, if you can hear me now. What yeah. inspired you to direct Rising Silence? I found the topic difficult to discuss with family in Bangladesh. People seem to wanna to forget them. Um, I'd like to apologize if this is discussed in the film. I haven't been able to find it. Where can I watch it? So tell us about, um, I think that, you know, I, I've had this um, response too from um, a lot of people who didn't grow up in Bangladesh um, who say that they find it very difficult to talk about the war or even people in Bangladesh who find it particularly difficult to talk about the sexual violence that happened in 1971. So if you can if, tell us really quickly um, a little bit about the film and um, you know, try to answer this question about these unspoken stories. Um, I, I I came to know about these women, uh, Birangana women, sexual violence survivors, 
of the Liberation War of Bangladesh from my father uh, when I was 17 years old. And uh, since then, uh, I wanted to meet them and uh, I couldn't find them anywhere. And they uh, remained um, statistics and, and honorific to me. Uh, but I wanted to know the person behind that statistics. Um, so when I first uh, saw them um, in 2010, uh, and I, I, I saw them at 21 of them uh, together, um, and I don't know why I wanted to um, kind of uh, save their stories uh, because um, uh, because there, there, there is uh, hardly any uh, documentation um, about them because it was destroyed after the after 1975 when the founder of the nation was assassinated they were just uh, thrown out in in streets uh, overnight and uh, and the documents were burnt uh, burned down uh, so there's very little documentation there out there uh, so I I was I was craving to know them. And uh, when I started uh, and when I, I spoke to them uh, and when they shared their stories, um, after that, um, for, for a couple of years, I, I was just sat with their interviews, um, but then um, one of them died. And that hit me so profusely. I realized that, you know, um, when a Birangona woman dies, her story dies with her. And that is, uh, that is one thing I couldn't bear. Uh, so I tried to try to hold on some of the stories and that is, that is why Rising Silence, um, you know, happened. Thank you, Lisa. There's a question from Monica. Um, hi, Monica, Fariha Chaudhry asks, as, as a British Bengali girl born and bred in the East End, I just want to say thank you so much for highlighting this very real and raw experience of many Bengali women when first migrating to any foreign land. I read a lot of reviews and found that many of the Brick Lane community itself were against the concept of making such a story come to life when filming the movie. I can understand why due to our culture still being quite male dominated and protective of reputation. What were your views on this reaction from the community and how did you overcome this critical feedback? Mm, okay. Um, you know, I had um, another uh, letter from uh, a Bangladeshi British writer who is hoping that it, that a book will be published next year. And it was really exactly on this um, topic, saying that they were worried about what the community reaction would be and can I share some advice or tell, tell them about my experience with negative reactions from the Bangladeshi diaspora. And, you know, it really saddened me because the perception seems to be that the reaction was overwhelmingly negative, but in fact, it was, <laughs> to my experience, it was overwhelmingly positive. Uh, there were a couple of, um, it was a handful of older conservative males who admitted that they hadn't read the book, but they didn't like the idea of the book. Um, perhaps they'd heard that, uh, a woman has an affair in it. I, I mean, I really don't know. I can only guess at the motivations, specifically around the filming. Uh, they were quoted in the Guardian newspaper as saying that they didn't want the scenes with leeches falling into curry pots it to be to be filmed, which you know, there was no such scene in the novel and there was no such scene in the book. So, um, you know, it was really a, a confection of a couple of uh, British newspapers rather than a reflection of the reaction of um, Bangladeshi heritage people. You know, I, that book took me all around the world and everywhere I went, I met people with a Bangladeshi heritage and they were all just, you know, uh, so supportive. And I, I would say that the dominant attitude was one of pride, mm. actually. Absolutely. You can certainly vouch for that. Um, was it, I mean, what was it like seeing your 
book turned into a film. I mean, was that a very surreal experience and seeing these people come to life who had only been in your mind up until that point? Yeah, I mean, I, I really liked the film. I think um, if there's one thing I would have done differently, I would have kept the riot scene um, that, that occurs towards the end of the book. I would have kept it in the movie because I think there was not enough tension when Shahana ran away. But apart from that, I think uh, Sarah Gavron uh, and Abby Morgan did a brilliant job. Uh, it strikes me now, though, that that, probably wouldn't happen that you would have a, a white writer and a white director <laughs> but anyway that, that's a, that's another uh, story I think they actually did a really great job it was wonderful um we have a question from Tamina Begum she asks when do you feel most free in writing um Nasima do you want to answer that and I, I would love it if all all three of you would answer that. When do I feel most free in writing? My favorite time to write is probably in the morning. Um, I I try to do this thing called morning pages. I'm sure a lot of writers try to do it um, and try to do it consistently. One thing about me is that I'm not consistent. Um, I try and write every morning. Um, so when I wake up, um, I'll just try and just do a bit of brain, brain brain dump um, and have a bit of a free write and just get whatever it is that I'm thinking, whatever I'm feeling, whatever thoughts I have that are in my head. If I've dreamt something, if I've had a nightmare, um, sometimes that's the best way when you're not really thinking about writing, um, that you get to have some of the most exciting things come out in your writing. And I usually, um, those are the things um, that I pick. So I'll pick maybe a line or two that are striking and I'll start like that. Um, with some poems. That's great. Monica or Lisa, want to tell us when you feel most free? I, I don't have a particular time of day or um, season or anything like that. It, you know, it, it's, I think um, Nassima was really saying it in just in a different way than perhaps I'd express it, which is you, you're always seeking to get into that flow state. So, you know, that state in which athletes talk about you know that they're, they're not thinking about their hand-eye coordination or whatever uh, they're just doing it because there's some sort of grace that comes into it that you know that is the ideal state for writing it doesn't always happen and you can't I can't always make it happen either I think that all we can do as writers is just keep practicing just keep doing the hard work just keep honing the craft and if you do enough of that then hopefully you you're able to recognize those moments of grace when they come that's great and I, I, I think uh, that uh, it's, it's random places, uh, I mean, uh, ideas come and, and I have lost so many ideas like that, you know, while riding uh, on a tube or, uh, or, or on a bus or um, having a shower. And I was like, oh my God, it's going away. I, I, need, to, I need to take it down. And, and then uh, when, I, uh, when I start writing, um, it doesn't matter whether, whether, if it is morning time or, or night. It, it, it just if, when I feel like writing it, I, I just do it. I don't have any particular time that uh, that I, I enjoy writing more or less. Yeah. Um, okay, I have a question for Nasima from Salma Imran. How do you relate Sultana's dream as a young person growing up in a postmodern and free society? I think they're talking about her having written from a position both historically because she wrote, you know, over a hundred years ago and also in her particular um, social context of, of basically having the experience of being confined um, and, and how you relate to that having not experienced that. Although I think we're both experiencing, we're all experiencing a form of confinement now, um, but certainly um, the world has, changed at least a little bit since her day. So how would you answer that, Nasima? What an exciting question. Um, I think, I feel like I'm really lucky because I grew up um, in a di different generation than, than you guys. Um, and I, for me, one of 
one of the things that I sit so um one of the things that that is really close to me is the fact that I grew up um in a household of real Islamic tradition rather than any cultural connotations. Um, I don't know how to read or write Bangla. I can just about speak it because of my job um, and because because of my family. And I feel like in my in my in my household, um, we grew up with such a strong Islamic Islamic ethos, and because of that, I was able to be free um, because I grew up and I and I knew what my rights were from a very young from a, having a very from being a very young young girl um and also having um five older very bossy sisters um, and and my mother as well just sort of always advising me on how to be and 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 what to be but also allowing me to to be who I want which is is quite a, quite an amazing thing because there's not many um, Bangladeshi women like us who are artists um and who get to do this and that is a real privilege um but yeah, it's down to coming from a very liberal family because of having such a strong um, Islamic ethos in my household. Well, it's really inspiring to hear you talking about um, your faith as being the thing that sort of um, frames your politics and, and almost makes that more possible. And I think for, for Begum Rokea, I think the situation uh, that she found herself in, which is living in a society where because she was born into a Muslim household, she was more confined and she really raged against that. And it was possibly, it was not possible for her to choose that identity as a source of empowerment and as a source of liberation. It was for her a symbol of confinement. And I, I, what I find really incredible about her work is that she wrote about this without attacking the religion or in even the culture. She talked simply about rights and she talked about access to education. And in Bangladesh, we have, um, you know, for a very poor country, one of the highest rates of girls' education. And the parity between boys and girls going to school um, is much higher than in all the other South, in, in the other South Asian countries. And I think it's a direct result of Begum Rokea. She is a national icon. She talked about um, the education of girls as being a, a, an issue that was a, of national importance. And somehow, because of the way she wrote, the accessibility of her work, um, the humor, the warmth, um, the way that she made those arguments so compelling, it, they, she almost turned them into national policy. Um, and I don't think I've ever seen a writer have an influence on, a feminist writer have as much of an influence on national policy. She didn't do it by standing on the streets and protesting. She did it by writing, and she did it by writing fiction um, especially in Sultana's dream. So it's really inspiring to hear you talk about your faith and how it's become a sort of beacon of political activism for you. Um, so I just wanted to ask, we have two more minutes. Um, if either Monica or Lisa wanted to say any final words about Rokea, um, about um, feminism in your work um, and how she may have inspired you in your lifetime in your work or even just tonight talking about her. Shall I go first? Please. Um, I mean, uh, us with, uh, women from uh, you know Bangladesh, especially, uh, Rokia actually um, has shaped our 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 thinking um, so deeply that uh, we 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 start seeing uh, what we did not have. Uh, we start realizing uh, the importance of education, importance of uh, of, of rights for women, uh, because we have seen that in in our household, um, confined uh, confinement for uh, rules, different rules for boys and different rules for girls, uh, and uh, and we we started seeing and realizing because of Rokia, because of Begum Rokia's uh, powerful, very forceful, fearless uh, writing. Uh, that um, th this is th this is uh, th this is what we deserve. Um, it is not something that needs to uh, you know needs to be um, needs to be given. Uh, this is our right, and and that 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 feeling um, absolutely uh, we we. Uh, 
got from Rukia. And we are so, uh, I mean, I can talk about myself. I'm so uh, grateful to her uh, because of her, um, how our path was, uh, was in front of her because she taught us how to dream. She taught us how to imagine. And, and she also taught us how to claim it um, uh, and, and practice it in our lives. So yeah, hey, Rukia. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, do you want to close us out, Monica? Well, I just want to say what a fantastic evening I've had listening to all of you and listening particularly to the readings. Thank you, Nasima. Um, I love Rakaya's sense of humor. I love her. Um, the artistry with which she draws this world it's a science fiction world with the solar heating and the flying cars it's fabulous it's fantastic she's got so many great ideas in there which are still ahead of their time um i'm glad that she's been such an, a, an inspiration for the education of girls i love her idea that girls should not be married until the age of 21 um, which I think there's some way to go in Bangladesh on that one. But, you know, uh, that, that's something to aspire to as well. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Nasima. You all just like lit up the virtual stage. It was such a pleasure. Thank you to the wonderful audience for your amazing questions. It was really um, a delight. And thank you to the British Library. And I hope you'll take the spirit, the fighting spirit of Rokea with you everywhere you go. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.